Hello everyone, uh, thank you for joining us today uh, for our latest HashiCorp snapshot titled How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love PKI, which will be presented today by Grant Orchard, a solution, Senior social, Solutions Engineer. Today, Grant is gonna show us how Vault takes the heavy lifting out of certificate management across your entire fleet. I also wanna note that this session is gonna be recorded and the recording will be made available in a day or two and we'll email it out to all of you. So today's demo will last about 15 minutes uh, to keep the timing uh, 15 minute time frame, uh, and we won't have any time to answer questions at the end. So please submit your questions through the demo via the Zoom Q&A tab and we'll, uh, we'll ensure that we get to them as we go. So with that, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, over to you, Grant. That's brilliant, thanks so much. Perfect timing, we've got a plane flying in over top. Apologies for the noise there. Um, so look, I think, you know, PKI is one of those topics which is, you know, it's, it's not particularly sexy on its own. But, you know, when we start to look more broadly at what's going on within, you know, the security realms, the current trend is, you know, towards things like, you know, moving towards mutual TLS for, um, you know, inter-service communication. Um, it's about how we actually provide things like uh, encryption in transit for, for our traffic, right, to provide greater levels of security. Uh, both of those things are actually underpinned by, by PKI, you know, as are many other elements around, you know, code signing, uh, you know, different things like SSH key signing and all the rest. So what I wanted to do today was just take you through uh, a little bit around PKI about just how things have changed and why you need to be able to automate um, all of your certificate management within your environment. So as a starting point, um, I think it's really worth clarifying that, you know, we've, we've seen some pretty significant change, right? We've moved from a scenario where all we had in the past was a traditional data center. And so as a result, within the data center, we sort of had, you know, this model, right? We've got our, our little guy in the red box down there. And we're going to assume, you know, he's, he's a bad person, right? Hence the cross in there. And the thing that was pretty safe to assume was that that bad person was sitting outside the four walls of our data center, right? So all you had to worry about was, okay, I need to make sure that communication between, you know, my users and my perimeter is going to be encrypted. And the way that we do that is through certificate management. And that was a fairly, you know, standard model that we saw. You, you know, go through, you'd be encrypted up until you hit the load balancer, and then you'd have um, SSL termination occurring at the load balancer. And once you're inside the network, you basically have traffic, you know, going between different machines, between different services there, as you can see with our little unlocked padlock, right? So you'd have um, just insecure, a standard uh, TCP or HTTP traffic, you know, communicating throughout there. Now, this was okay within the old model, right? But the reality is that as we've seen the move towards public cloud, you know, that, that private cloud system continues to exist um, and, and your data centers continue to exist but now you're starting to extend them out into public clouds and you're connecting them, you know, you've got express routes, you've got direct connects or using SD-WAN or something like that. And what happens as a result is that you no longer control the four walls of the data center, right? So your perimeter becomes a logical construct. And so all it takes is for, you know, maybe a small misconfiguration to occur or something. And before you know it, that little guy inside the red box has basically managed to come through one of those gaps in your, you know, new logical perimeter and is operating within your network, right? And so this becomes then the new paradigm that we have to operate in when we start thinking about uh, security, specifically within the cloud um, and even within your own data center as you start actually, you know, to, to move that out. Probably worth noting that even within the four walls of your data center, you can have misconfigurations, you could have, you know, uh, unpatched boxes with uh, zero day vulnerabilities that permit someone to get inside your network. So it's probably safe to say that as a starting point, we just need to assume that that perimeter there on our, on our picture that was a solid line just a moment ago has become, you know, a lot easier to actually get through. And once you do that, you, you start to realize, heck, it's only a matter of time basically until someone is in our network for long enough that they're going to start getting access to secrets, right? They're going to start sniffing traffic. Um, and in our pro previous diagram, where we looked at that idea of terminating SSL at the load balancer and then just having unencrypted communications inside the network, sniffing that, you know, capturing information becomes incredibly easy. So this diagram that we're showing here really presents us with 
a very different model, right? Which is that each of our boxes then need to be uh, basically using TLS uh, as, as a mechanism for encrypting your data in transit. Now, our database on the back end there has a little document, you'll notice sort of to that, that bottom right hand side over there, which is sort of indicative of the data. Now, absolutely, it's safe to say that, you know, as much as you're encrypting your data in transit, there's still a risk when it comes to data at rest, right? So being concerned and being able to uh, be certain that if someone's on your network and they do like a select star from table, um, they're not going to get a clear set of text back is definitely another use case that uh, Vault can help out with, but not the focus of today's talk, but definitely worth considering in a, in a broader model um, as far as we look at it. Now, as I said, we start to move towards this idea of if somebody is within our network, it's only a matter of time until they actually manage to get their hands on secrets. Now, I was, on, um, I was on Twitter last night. One of my buddies in, in India has started going through his master's uh, for computer science. And as part of that, he's doing a little bit of a security project. And he was tweeting about how just by grabbing, I think he grabbed three, three public keys, he was actually able to uh, reverse engineer and figure out what the backend private key for that was. Now, the minute you've got your private key and your public key, you're able to do one of two things, right? Which is intercept traffic and impersonate you know potentially one of these services or just be able to decrypt uh, the traffic that's actually flowing and be able to then once again understand it and see what's going on so how do you protect against that the the approach that we take within hashicorp and specifically within vault is that we encourage you to move to a model whereby all of your secrets not just your certificates but for today let's focus on certificates all of those move towards a very short time to live so instead of your certificates lasting for, who knows, five years, right? Three years, one year, we can actually start to peel that back and say, well, what, what do we think is actually an acceptable risk profile for us to take? Maybe we can say, you know, we're going to rotate these every day. Maybe we're going to rotate these every week. And again, once we accept that as a paradigm, we move on to the next challenge, you know, how long is it going to take you to submit, you know, a CSR into your security team and then get back a certificate and then be able to replace it on a machine? You know, it, it becomes very, very clear that this is not a manual process that we can address. And it's not something that you're going to handle um, operationally without actually introducing some automation into the process. So what I'm going to take you through now, we're going to shift gears a little. I've sort of explained the problem space. Um, I've given you a hint as to what the resolution for actually uh, working with that is. What we're going to do next is actually jump in and have a little look at Vault um, and how we enable you to basically take the control and the requirement for hands-on management out of, out of an individual operator and actually give our machines the capability to dynamically generate certificates themselves. All right, so here we are within the Vault UI. I'm going to do this from within the UI just because it's a little bit more interactive than, uh, than doing it within the CLI. And you can see here, we've got a couple of secrets engines enabled. Now, you can probably guess that the one we're after here in particular is gonna be PKI. And when we come in here, you see a role, what we call a role. And you might wonder, what on earth does a role actually have to do with certificates? Well, it turns out that, as I said, when we're actually doing things like saying, hey, well, we don't actually wanna be issuing that. What I wanna do is go look at the configuration. There we go. All right. So when we look at the concept of a role, what we're really doing is saying, you know, when you issue a certificate, there's going to be a certain set of parameters that, you know, are going to be permitted, that are going to be required to be included as part of that signing request. And potentially certain things are going to go on here. Now, as an example, oops, it's going to highlight, going to work there. Yep, there we go. All right. So if we choose to have enforce, I'm, I'm clearly struggling here today. All right, there we go. If we choose to have enforce host names enabled, what does this mean? Well, it means that when you actually have a machine that reaches out to Vault and says, hey, I need a new certificate, it's not gonna be able to impersonate another machine. So in the same way as we might do things like host key checking to say, hey, you know, this key doesn't actually match, or in a similar way, when we go to a website, um, you know, and it's amazing still the number of websites where I go to, and you see that they've got a certificate that's been issued to www um, host name, domain name, uh, and yet their website is actually just published without the www. And so what's happened is then you get a mismatch and it says, hey, we don't actually trust 
um, the fact that the machine that's presenting this is actually you know, resolving the same as what's actually within the certificate. So we end up then with this capability to say, yep, we want to make sure we're enforcing host names. Um, do we allow you to bring IP subject alternate names in there, right? Um, you know, obviously we probably want to require a common name in most cases um, and so on and so forth. And there's some of those defaults that you might want to provide around your organizational unit, the organization, the location, all those elements that actually come into play um, are defined as part of that role. So key usage is probably a really, really good example of um, where you might start to think about providing a more discreet approach towards uh, the concept of roles. Uh, so digital signature could be the one that we're after and being able to say, right, this key can only be used for digital signature means that once again, if anybody was to gain access for a particular reason, um, you know, via you know, credential sniffing or something, into Vault to be able to request a certificate, what they actually get access to is very, very limited and, and really descoped. So the one other element um, that becomes quite important, where's my TTL gone? Tell me, oops, there it is, all right. Um, so that concept that I mentioned of the idea of TTL, so this is in seconds. If we take a look, by default, our certificate, certificates are going to get issued here with a five minute TTL. Might seem kind of crazy, but what it means is that um, effectively every five minutes, this cert is gonna come up for renewal. And so that means that it's gonna be very much um, up to date. The opportunity uh, for any kind of you know, public private key pair that gets captured to be used is a very, very short window, right? Um, becomes very useful, but again, you probably think to yourself, gosh, that's a, that's a pretty big management overhead. The way that we get around that is by uh, installing a Vault client onto each of our remote nodes. So what I'm gonna do is just take you over to a little bit of code here, if I can, there we go. All right, so this is um, a configuration file and I'm just gonna zoom in a little bit. Um, so what we're able to do with our Vault client is leverage the idea of you know, cloud-based um, authentication and authorization to say who you are and what you should have access to. And then we can actually configure a template to say, hey, um, so you remember the name of our role there was Nginx. So what we're gonna do is uh, basically say, I want you to look at this path um, and, and watch it and keep track of my certificate. And Vault's going to check the TTL of your certificate. And the minute that you're actually 50% of the way through, uh, so in the case of our example role, every two and a half minutes, it's actually then going to do a put and say, hey, here is my, um, here's my common name. Here's the alternate name that I actually want to submit. Um, and then what I want you to do is actually write the return that you actually get back when that certificate is generated out to a file on my local machine. Now you can see here, we've got this uh, template command. Now, um, because this is using Jinja templating effectively to render this out, that's a variable at the moment. Uh, but all we're doing with that command is saying, all right, I want you to tell Nginx now that it's got a new certificate to basically restart the service. So it'll then pick that up from the file um, because that's the way that Nginx actually handles this stuff. You could do the same thing by writing through um, the values directly into an environment variable. Um, if your application has the ability to do so, you could actually have a query vault um, on a semi-regular basis to actually pick up that data. All right, now I'm just looking at the time here and we're starting to run a little bit short as far as, uh, as, far as demo content goes. But let's just very, very quickly um, delve into one of the elements regarding policies, right? So this here is a secret path. So I've mentioned here, if we take a look at it, um, you come in here and you say, I wanna hit the PKI engine, I wanna hit the Nginx role and I want you to issue me a certificate. So how do we go then about providing you know, making sure that not every machine could just hit every single one of these. And the way that we do that is actually by hand, uh, by providing a policy. So here's the policy that dictates access um, into that particular set. And what we've done here is say, all right, the role is for PKI. Um, you've got the ability to issue against the role Nginx. And in fact, what we're gonna give you the ability to do is say, hey, yeah, let's, let's do the issue against specifically, again, using some of that ginger templating, my virtual machine name. Now we're reading that metadata in um, as part of the uh, information that our machines provide to authenticate. So within um, Azure, within AWS, within GCP, machines are actually able to say, hey, here is my identity through either something like managed service or through, um, Gosh, I can't remember the name of the rest of them. 
but uh, basically providing their own identity via their own metadata into Vault. Vault will then go back and query AWS, Azure, GCP, and say, hey, this machine's trying to authenticate. Um, it's coming from you know, this particular subscription or this account or this project, and it's given me this ID. Is this legitimate? And at that point, Vault will say, yeah, yeah, that's cool. You're able to authenticate. And then based on the policies that you inherit, you're going to get access to a certain set of secrets within the system. So kind of run out of time here to go any deeper on the demo here, but suffice to say um, that once we actually start provisioning machines and workloads out, they can then connect directly back to Vault. They can hit this secret path. They can generate and rotate their own secrets on demand, which means that you then basically take the entire headache of PKI management manually out of the hands of the administrators and turn it into a completely automated process between Vault and your client machines without you ever needing to get involved. All right, I'm just gonna hand back over to Ilch now. Thanks for that presentation and demo, Grant. That was very good. Uh, look, now I'm just gonna look to see if we have any questions. Uh, if you do have any questions, uh, you can contact Grant directly via the contact details shown on your screen there. Um, I'm just looking. Does it look there are any questions on our Q&A tab there, Grant? So, well, folks, um, that brings us to the end of our session today. We hope you found it useful. As I mentioned earlier, this session was recorded and we'll make the recording available on our website soon. You'll also receive an email soon with the link to the recording. If you like what you heard today and want to learn more about Vault, I encourage you to check out the Learn pages on our website, which you can uh, find at learn.hashicorp.com. And don't forget to register for our next snapshot using console to connect Kubernetes to the outside world, which will be held on the 21st of July. Uh, register at hashicorp.com slash events forward slash hashtag snapshots. Thanks again for joining us today. And a big thank you to Grant uh, for presenting. Enjoy the rest of your day and bye for now.